Yeah. Welcome back. We are trying something different for once we are not cycling. Um, I finished my trip Berlin to Lisbon actually quite some time ago and I'm now based in Lisbon. I've just been extra extra busy but a lot of you have been messaging here on YouTube and on Instagram asking how the trip went and most of all what equipment did I use and it's a very fair question and also I'm a huge huge fan of equipment video I watched hundreds and I base most of them in my decision on YouTube channels I like so I thought it is about time that I make my own and to avoid making this video 30 to 40 minutes long, I'm just gonna focus on the four main areas I struggle with. So I'm gonna talk about my bike choice, my tent choice, the sleeping setup that I had, and the cooking setup that I had. So I think these are the four areas where you can have, where you can find definitely a lot of variety, both in, in the options, technical options, and in the pricing. Uh, and as well, it's where you have to be a bit more mindful for the weight you're carrying. Well, it doesn't really matter which type of shirt you're wearing. So I decided to focus on these four. If you're interested in knowing more about everything that I brought with me on the bike, and if you've seen my pictures on Instagram, I was slightly overpacked. So I will try to go a bit lighter next. But if you want to find a list of everything I brought, there's a link in the description with a template to help you plan your bike tour. And in there you have a list also of uh, toiletry, uh, clothing, so everything you can find in there. But for now we focus on these four areas, so let's jump right into and uh, check my bike choice. Little change of scenery, we are now in a park and behind me you can see Olive, my bike. Clearly the first thing you have to pick when deciding to go for a bike tour is your bike. And I wanted to start before jumping into all the type of bikes you have and options and so that you can do a bike tour with any bike you have. I have met people that are really traveling with their city bike or with a mountain bike, whatever they had in the garage. And I think it's really important because many people think this is a big obstacle and they think they would have to spend so much money for a new bike. And actually it all depends on how you want to approach the tour. Of course, having specific bikes makes it more comfortable and you can maybe go for more kilometers on the same day. But if you are relaxed and you decide to do shorter distances for each day, you can really go with almost any bike, really. So now this said, this was the disclaimer at the beginning, very important to make it very inclusive. Um, I want to explain a little bit the options. I don't know if you know anything about bike, bike tourings, but there are two main types of bike you can go for. And the two bikes have two different setups. So the first one is uh, the bike touring bike, which is the one you've probably seen around already, is a more traditional one. So it's a sturdier steel bike, very hard to break, very easy to find ways of fixing it everywhere in the world. And that's why many tourers use these kind of bikes if they're going a bit off the beaten path or outside of Europe, for example. Uh, and also it has mounts uh, for racks or sometimes it even comes with racks already when you buy it so you can carry much more weight and it is more practical and you don't really have uh, to worry about loading it too much as that's the purpose of the bike. The second options you have and it's something that became a bit trendier in the last few years is going with a gravel bike and usually this bike you uh, use with a bike packing setup that looks a little bit like this so you can see it has a bit uh, lighter weight usually the bike is in aluminum or even in carbon so it is a bit more performance oriented and as you can see a car gravel bike is basically a road bike with just thicker tires so a road bike that you can use anywhere and that allows you to also go outside of the road as you have seen from my video i went for a gravel bike but my setup was a bit of a mix of the two, which I don't know if I would really recommend. It has worked for me and I'm probably gonna continue on this one, but it is not the ideal setup for this bike. The bike I went for is a Specialized Average Comp, of which I am really, really happy. So as you can see, it really looks like a road bike and, um, and I recently changed my tires to a bit more gravelly tires so that I can more easily cycle around in Lisbon. Uh, also, it has the special feature of the uh, amortization in the handlebar that made it very comfortable when having a lot of weight and going um, on cobblestones or on gravel itself. And in the back, it has um, these mounts for the rack. Um, so I was able to have this mixed setup that looks a bit funny, but it worked for me. 
And the third, the, thir the third pro is that I can use this bike all year round. I picked it because I train road biking and I didn't just want to have a touring bike that I only use when I'm touring. I want to have something that is flexible and that I can use all the time. So this really works well for me and that's why I decided to go for this mixed version. It, of course, not going with a bike touring bike has some downsides. So it has the mounts for the rack, but as you can see, the paint has gotten all ruined and it is probably not the best idea to use it a lot with a rack and especially not with a lot of weight. In the trip this summer, I'll definitely try and load it less because um, it doesn't work. I even broke a rack, I had to buy a new one during my tour. So this is a big downside. And um, yeah, the second thing is that it is more fragile because the frame is aluminum and the fork is carbon. So it doesn't really give you the flexibility of, for example, putting the bike in the, in the trunk of a bus or leaving it anywhere on the train because you're always worried of ruining the frame. So these are the pros and cons of going with a gravel bike. I've used it also with a bike packing setup and of course that's the ideal one for it. Uh, because then you can be a bit more performance oriented having everything mounted on the bike makes you a bit more aerodynamic and you can go faster and you can enjoy much more going on gravel because as soon as you have the rack everything is shaking so it is not the ideal situation uh, but everything depends on the type of tour you want to do uh, feel free to message below if you have an idea of the tour you want to do and you need suggestions for the type of bike or you have some bikes you're considering and you want to have recommendations i can definitely check them for you um, but now let's move to the next section which is the tent all right, as you can see, we have a, a little change of clothing. My camera died. So this is the second shooting of this video. And, and we're here to talk about the tent. So there are a lot of technical specifications you find when you're looking about each tent. It makes it very complicated. I realize there are four main things that you have to consider when buying a tent. Do you want to have a tent that is freestanding or that uh, that has to be pitched. What does it mean? So as you can see, this tent I can put anywhere. The poles just connect and the tent doesn't have to be connected to the ground and I can move it around very easily. Well, if you have a tent that has to be pitched, usually there is just one pole in the middle and you need to connect to the ground, which usually makes it lighter, but also a bit more complicated because you need to always have the perfect ground or some trees to connect the cables. So this is up to you and you know where you will be camping, but keep, keep this in mind when purchasing your tent. The second thing is the weight. So how heavy do you want your tent to be? I think for bike touring, you can also go for less technical things. You don't need to have the one kilo tent, something like two kilos, three kilos, it's also fine, especially if it's the first time, it's gonna be cheaper. But um, I realized that I'm gonna use my tent also for hiking, hence, I really want something very lightweight. I went for the MSR Haba Haba, which is the traditional traditional tent of bike tourers. Uh, and it's about one kilo 15, I think. Uh, so it's quite lightweight. And I know I'm gonna be able to carry it in a backpack whenever I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go hiking. Another thing you find a lot when looking for tents is the seasons. What does it mean? So you can have two season tents, three season, four season, every season tent really. So this, this one is a three season tent, which means that it's fine from spring to autumn. This makes it a bit cheaper than going for a four season tent that usually has uh, a little bit stronger materials to be able to deal with, for example, winter or snow conditions. If you're planning to tour only in the summer, you may be fine just using a a summer tent which definitely will be cheaper but probably less resistant to rain so this is something you have to keep in mind and the final thing is the size so how many people are you gonna be are you gonna tour alone and how much space do you and how much comfort do you want to have inside your tent I decided to go for a two people tent in the end because first of all I had people visiting in my tour so I wanted to have space to welcome them and not having them bring their own tent and the second thing is that I biked in Germany and it was raining a lot. So this made it very easy to keep my bike, the, my bags inside with me when it was raining. Uh, yeah, and be very and be very relaxed about it. It is up to you, of course, having a one person tent will make you more lightweight and uh, easier, for example, to go with a bike packing setup. Uh, with this in mind, also consider the external space, not only the internal space of the tent, because some tents have only one uh, veranda, so only one covered area outside, 
and sometimes have two. This one, for example, has two. And I think this was really, really helpful because when it was raining, I could have my bags only on one side of the tent while maybe being covered and cooking on the other side of the tent. So keep this in mind if you have a lot of material and you're going in a rainy area, uh, I think this is quite, quite relevant. Moving now to the sleeping setup. This is my uh, amazing, amazing sleeping bag. It's a Thermostar Questor for zero degrees. And this is like the bag it comes into, so the, the bag that you can use to store it. And that's for now how I keep it in my room. And like moving on now to the amazing sleeping bag. Why did I choose this sleeping bag? Well, first of all, because it was in discount. So it came with a great cost, uh, cost quality ratio. Uh, the second thing is that I really want something that I could use to hike because I also hike uh, and to use in the mountains. So this says it's, um, well, the limit is zero degrees, but I don't think I will ever go hike in the winter anyway. So it's something that would make me comfortable at like five to 10 degrees Celsius, which is perfect for, for what I have to do. Also, it's, it's very comfortable because it's down. So when you're picking a sleeping bag, you mainly have to choose between down or synthetic sleeping bags. This one is down, uh, which makes it very packable. You will see now how small it can get. Uh, and uh, the upside of this is that it has hydrophobic down. So the down is treated because usually the problem with down is that if it gets wet, then it's very, very difficult to get it dry again. And this one, um, well, I never had the case actually, but theoretically it's gonna be fine even if it gets some water on it. And sometimes actually you have humidity in the tent, so it's really nice to have something that is hydrophobic. Uh, it comes with some uh, nice additional features as this amazing hood that made it very comfortable when it was a bit colder in Germany. And I must say, it has this additional feature that I actually never, never, ever use. So in the future, I would probably just leave it home. It comes with this stretchy things in the back so that you can, can connect uh, the sleeping bag to the mattress. But uh, I don't move that much at night, so it was really fine. And it's very wide, especially for, for a girl. For me, this uh, it comes in one size. This is the normal size and then it comes with a large size as well. But for me, it was really plenty of space. Uh, so it didn't feel too constricted like the usual mummy, mummy sleeping bags. Moving now to the mattress. This was uh, quite an important choice and I'm happy I went with comfort for my first trip. Otherwise it would have been probably very traumatic. When you're looking for mattresses, you have to consider whether you want to go for the self-inflating road or for the, the one that you have to inflate yourself. I decided to go for the self-inflating. Self-inflating means that it usually has a foam inside that makes it much more comfortable. Um, however, it comes down also to the bulkiness. Once you have the foam, you cannot really reduce the size. Well, the ones you're inflating yourself, they can really become dismal. Uh, yeah, as I said, for the first trip, I think it was really, really a good choice because this makes sleeping almost as if you were on a bed. But for the next trip, as I wanna uh, reduce the, the size of my bags and be a bit more performance oriented, I think I'll move to something that I can inflate myself, which of course would be also less comfortable. Uh, this one specifically is the cheapest self inflating masses they have from Sea to Summit. And I picked this brand specifically just because I found it on discount. But I was really, really happy with it. Um, I had no problems. And it comes also with some isolation, uh, isolation benefit. So the, especially the ones that are self-inflating as mattresses, uh, sometimes have information about how isolating they are, which means that they also um, help you keep warm uh, when the, the ground is very cold, besides, besides the support that you get from your sleeping bag. So this had some and it definitely made it um, very easy to travel in Germany when it was uh, a, bit, a bit colder. In addition, you may want to consider also buying a pillow. It really makes a difference. I did my first trips only using some clothes and like a sweater and using it to sleep. But it really makes a difference having a proper pillow. I decided to go for something super lightweight, as you can see it's very packable and I will show you how it looks once it's inflated. Uh, you also have some other version, versions of uh, smaller cotton pillows that resemble more the pillow you would use in your bed. 
All right, let's now move to my kitchen. It is very important to say that I'm Italian and cooking was a big part of my trip. I almost cooked every night. If you've seen some of my stories on Instagram, you can see that every day I was improvising with something in the camping spot. And also it's important to say that I had guests, so I brought two pots that were big enough to cook for two people. If you're traveling alone, you can definitely reduce the amount of things uh, you're carrying with you. But now let's, let's have an overview of what I have in my kitchen bag. Okay, here is an overview of everything that is part of my kitchen. This one, and now we'll look into it, is the stove. And these two are two items to uh, protect from, from the wind. This is the container for the, for the fuel that connects to the stove. This was a container for water that was quite helpful in campings when I was far from the bathrooms and then I could easily use this to clean and cook. And this uh, is uh, all my stoves and already containing a cutting board and some other things. And now we will go into each element. Moving now to the proper cooking sets that I had. Again, MSR, I must say I'm a big fan of MSR material. So I decided to get a combination of the two pots. So it's uh, set up for two people. So everything is in these uh, mesh bags like this. And there is also a little uh, cleaning towel here that you can use in the campings. It comes with a little cutting board, which proved very, very helpful. I use it a lot. And as you can see here, so it has three sections in this. So these are two pots that go one inside the other one. And this one can be used as a, as a lid or turned I use just as a, as a pen. So I've done both and actually this is, I've used also as my plate in some occasions. So it's really, really, uh, it's really easy to combine the things. And inside here, there is a little bag with some extra uh, elements. And I must say some I would change for the future trip. So I can already go into that. So this is the fundamental. Uh, this is how you can move everything. So this one, you must have, of course, and it comes with the pots. And then inside here, there is a little thing that came for the oil, this little container. I must say, I never used it because it's just such a pain. Okay, a few times I found some people like, that hosted me and I could refill it, but ultimately in some shops, I found some oil bottles that were this big and I cook a lot. So it just made sense to have the oil bottle instead of all the time transferring into this small one. Um, and it came with these two things to cook that can be built. This one was amazing. I've used it a few times for pasta, it's perfect. But um, this one, it's really, it's too, so the plastic is too soft. So I think I will replace it with just a small wooden uh, item in the future because it was really difficult to clean the, the pan when I was cooking something that was a bit sticky. So I, I, yeah, I wouldn't recommend this one. I wouldn't keep it. And inside here, the other two fundamental elements. This one is a salt and pepper. Use it a lot. Of course, I had a, an extra salt bag for my pasta. Uh, and I also brought with me a little container with some herbs that I mixed. And this one is uh, a lighter that you need to turn on the cooking setup. Stove that looks like this and can be open and looks like this. Um, so when you're choosing which type of stove is best for you, you have to consider what type of trips you want to go for. Uh, the choice is usually between this one, so it's a stove that connects to a bottle like this. This contains fuel, so exactly like petrol that you put in your car. Or go for one of the more traditional ones you've probably seen in camping spots already. It has a little attachment and a canister. I'll, I'll put a picture somewhere here. Definitely both, uh, both uh, cooking stoves have pros and cons. Uh, the upsides uh, of the canister is that it very, it's very simple to use, it's very clean, you don't really have, uh, have to worry about uh, all this system that you have to turn on, you just have a system integrated and you can simply buy it at your, at your camping stores. Um, however, I decided to go for this version because uh, with the canister you never know when it's uh, finishing and you cannot always find a canister in every place. So if you're already traveling for two months, for example, and you're traveling multiple locations internationally, then it's quite unpredictable whether you're gonna be able to find a canister that fits your specific cooking thing. And also, if you're going in places like north of Sweden or doing a trip in Africa or in Southeast Asia, then it's not so likely that you're always gonna find the canister 
that you need. Well, this one, you just, uh, you simply go to the gas station. Everybody was always looking at me very weirdly coming in with a bike at the gas station. And then you refill this, it's a uh, half a liter. Um, and it's really simple. And then you, you use this little element that goes inside once you open it to transform it into gas. And then you connect it to the stove to cook. So I already imagine that if I'm ever gonna take a trip in some areas that are a bit more remote, then I can carry an extra bottle, so not this one specifically, but like a plastic bottle with extra petrol, so I can really be autonomous for a longer time. Yeah, so this is everything about uh, the stove. The one I decided to go for is the MSR Dragonfly because I had a lot of good recommendation and it really looked like the most future-proof I could get. And also it's very big, as you can see, so like the base, it's very big, which makes it very easy to cook. I could really like put the pot and leave it there and not have to check that it was on balance and do other stuff at the same time. So it almost felt like a real, real life kitchen in a way. Um, yeah, so this is everything. I'll show quickly how it looks. I want to start by saying that I really love my MSR Dragonfly. It's definitely the best stove that one could get. But there are some warnings if you decide to go for this one that you should keep in mind. So the first one is that it's very noisy. So if you want to be hated by your camping uh, neighbors, especially when you're waking up early in the morning, sometimes I prep coffee at like 4, 5 a.m. And I, it was really painful because everything was very silent and then you could really hear uh, how noisy it is. And the second thing is that um, since you use it with petrol, it gets very dirty. So as soon as you touch it, your hands also get dirty. And to turn it on often, you get some petrol on your hands, so it's a bit smelly. But I think still, it's, it's, it's so worth it. I refilled the bottle for this one like four times during the trip, which was really cheap because again, there's half a liter of uh, normal petrol. Uh, yeah, and it made it super easy to cook all the time. And I just kept it empty when I knew I was gonna, gonna be hosted for a week. So for me, it's, uh, yeah, really is the one that I'm gonna keep going with. I'll put some uh, affiliate links into the description. Feel free to <laughs> to uh, give me money <laughs> to order.